my fellow Americans. might be wondering why in the world is there a 30 minute countdown before the show starts well we actually start live every day at 4 p.m eastern time so this whole 30 minute countdown is a chance for youtube and rumble to send out their alerts and notifications so we encourage you to gather up and hang out with everyone in the chat room so every day at 4 p.m eastern time is when we do this show live you can join us for the countdown if you like or just set your clock and reminder that at 4 p.m eastern is when we go live you can also make sure you subscribe and turn on that bell notification notification. So hopefully you will get a notification. about dictators of countries like Indonesia, who we sell weapons to, yet they are slaughtering people in East Timor? What do you have to say about Israel, who is slaughtering Palestinians, who impose martial law? What do you have to say about that? Those are our allies. Why do we sell weapons to these countries? Why do we support them? Why do we bomb Iraq when it commits similar problems? examples of things that are not right in this world and the United States is trying <laughs> I uh, really am surprised that people feel that it is necessary to defend the rights of Saddam Hussein when what we ought to be thinking about is how to make sure that he does not use weapons of mass destruction I'd like to who are like shouting to just a moment I'm not defending them in the least. What I am saying is that there needs to be consistent application of U.S. foreign policy. We cannot support people who are committing the same violations because they are political allies. That is not acceptable. We cannot via violate U.N. resolutions when it is convenient to us. We You're not answering my question, answer. Madam Albright. Uh. press, did you not, when you were there? Well, I had several jobs. One of my jobs was that of analyst. Uh, I also was an interrogator and indeed briefed the press when we, the CIA, wanted to uh, circulate disinformation on a particular issue. Disinformation is not necessarily, uh, not necessarily a lie, it may be a half-truth. And uh, we would pick out a journalist. I would go do the briefing and uh, hope that he would put the information in print. What was your percentage of success? We were pretty successful in planning um, information of a rather rarefied nature. For instance, uh, if we wanted to get uh, across to the American public that the North Vietnamese were building up their force structure in South Vietnam, I would go to a journalist and advise him that in the past uh, six months, X number of North Vietnamese forces had come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail system through southern Laos. Now, there is no way a journalist can check that information. Uh, that's data derived from uh, uh, radio intercepts, uh, spy in the uh, sky photography. So either he goes with the information or he doesn't, and ordinarily or usually, the journalist would go with it because it, was, it looked like some kind of exclusive go after these gentlemen. Uh, I would uh, be directed to cultivate them, to spend time with them at uh, the Caravelle Hotel or the Continental Hotel, to socialize with them, and, and slowly but surely to try to gain their confidence by dolloping out uh, valid information, information which was true. And then I would drop in uh, into a conversation the data 
that we wanted to get across which might not be true. Uh, one piece of data, for instance, uh, that uh, we managed to plan in the New Yorker magazine had to do with uh, a supposed North Vietnamese effort in 1973 to develop airfields along the border of South Vietnam. The reason we wanted to plant this information was that uh, we were trying to persuade the U.S. Congress that Saigon should uh, be continued to uh, should continue to get a great deal of aid. Uh, and that uh, the North Vietnamese were the chief violators of the ceasefire accord. That was printed in uh, uh, the New Yorker magazine under the byline of Robert Chaplin, as indeed was a great deal of such information which, uh, which we tried to circulate. Frank, a, a two-part question. What, what were the objectives of the, or what was the objective of the CIA what about the moral implications of what you were doing in feeding this information? Did the objective override the moral implications, moral problems? Well, the objective of the agency in general is to generate intelligence and get it back to Washington, to, to get at the truth and make sure the policymakers understand it. When you pl plant disinformation, you are diverging from that objective, and I think probably in retrospect, it was uh, very counterproductive. I am as an XCI agent uh, opposed to the disinformation activities uh, in which I was involved. I admit that I was involved and I think it uh, uh, served no useful purpose. Uh, propagandizing the American uh, public or Congress is not the CIA's job. Uh, as to the morality of what the CIA was doing or that particular uh, activity, uh, the war was a very relative thing. It was a relativist environment and uh, morality seldom came into play when uh, you were operating in the field. Uh, in my estimation, a CIA man should be amoral. Uh, that may sound pretty shocking to somebody, but what if my morality were that of a, a Nazi or agent, if you will? You wouldn't want me to be your intelligence officer. Keep the morals out of intelligence. Keep the truth in and stay away from disinformation. would have been more appropriate for Mr. Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, to address this House according to Article 144, an article which was specifically designed to debate violations of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, which is clearly the case with Mr. Trudeau. Then again, a Prime Minister who openly admires the Chinese basic dictatorship who tramples on fundamental rights by persecuting and criminalizing his own citizens as terrorists just because they dared to stand up to his perverted concept of democracy should not be allowed to speak in this house at all. Mr. Trudeau, you are a disgrace for any democracy. Please spare us your presence. Thank you. colleagues but the answer to war is not more war it's peace and peace isn't delivered by the barrel of a gun it's delivered by diplomacy by dialogue you can wish away your continent's history but we share a continent with russia we will sit down with russia there will be a negotiated peace and this organization should be promoting it earlier rather than delaying it and making sure that more ukrainians die your feigning of sympathy rings hollow it makes me sick to be honest with you
we become involved when disinformation poses a threat to the security of our country. It is when there's a connectivity to th a threat to our country. It could be a threat, a connectivity to violence. And what this, what this working group does, uh, what this working group does is precisely what I would think you would want it to do, which is to take a look at the work, the disinformation work that our department has done and ask the following questions. Do we have policies? Do we have guardrails? Do we have yeah, standards? But here's the problem. Work? We can't even agree. We can't even me. agree what disinformation is. This is you well, can't even agree that it was disinformation, that the Russians fed information to the Steele dossier. You can't agree to that. How are we ever going to come to an agreement on what is disinformation so you can police it on social media? Senator, I have two points, if I may uh, finish. Um, uh, number one, that what this office, what the, I'm sorry, what this working group does, because it's not an office, what this working group does is ensure that there are guardrails, definitions, standards to make sure that the free speech rights, the civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy rights of individuals so are do not think, do you think COVID, do you think and COVID, two, do you think COVID, disinfor, do you think COVID disinformation threatens our national security? And number two, if I may, Senator, and number two, is it your proposition that when the cartels spread disinformation with respect to our immigration policies to try to lure vulnerable migrants to our border illegally? I think you've got no idea what disinformation is, and I don't think the government's capable of it. Do you know who the greatest propagator of disinformation in the history of the world is? The U.S. government. Are you familiar with McNamara, the Pentagon Papers? Are you familiar with George W. Bush and the weapons of mass destruction? Are you familiar with Iran-Contra? I mean, think of all the debates and disputes we've had over the last 50 years in our country. We work them out by debating them. We don't work them out by the government being the arbiter. I don't want you to guardrails. I want you to have nothing to do with speech. You think we can't determine, you know, speech by traffickers is disinformation? You think the American people are so stupid they need you to tell them what the truth is? You can't even admit what the truth is with the Steele dossier. I don't trust government to figure out what the truth is. Exactly. Government is largely disseminating disinformation. Hey everyone, just as a reminder, hey, our show starts at 4 p.m. Eastern time, just a few minutes from now, but I should remind you that we have a daily newsletter. It's totally free. Natalie and I work very hard on it every morning over our cup of coffee, putting the stories together that we think are important that the mainstream media is going to ignore. All you need to do is go to our website. It's just redacted.inc. Put in your email address. We won't ever sell your email to anybody. And then you'll receive a welcome email. And all you need to do is verify that email and 7 a.m. Eastern time is when we send out our daily newsletter. And it's about about five or 10 minutes in length that you can read it over your cup of coffee. And like I said, we cover four or five of the big stories of the day, plus a couple of things you might have missed while you were sleeping. We try to have some fun with it, add a little humor into it. Uh, and again, it's a great way to start off your morning. But it's also a great way for us to stay connected with you as well, because we've been banned and blocked on some of these platforms before, where we haven't been allowed to post anything, not even a community post. So the only way for us to stay connected with you is through our newsletter. We were able to send out a newsletter and say, hey, everyone, we're blocked for the next week and let you know what was actually going on with our show. Anyway, go to redacted.inc and sign up for the free newsletter and it'll be posted first thing in the morning over your cup of coffee. is a bit of an aside, um, but in terms of how you think about problem sets, I, when I was a cadet, what's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. I, I, I was a CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's, it's like, we, we, had, we had entire 
We had entire training courses. Uh, We had a good, we had a good d d discussion on ensuring global energy security and adequate oil supplies to support global economic growth, and that will begin shortly. I'm, and, uh, and I'm doing all I can to increase the supply for the United States of America, which I expect to happen. The Saudis share that urgency, and based on our discussions today, I expect we'll see further steps in the coming weeks. Are you worried about it? One of the hopeful things that I've discovered is that nearly every war that has started in the past 50 years has been a result of media lies. The media could have stopped it if they had searched deep enough, if they hadn't um, reprinted government propaganda, they could have stopped it. But what does that mean? Well, that means basically populations don't like war. And populations have to be fooled into war. Populations don't willingly and op with open eyes go into a war. So if we have a good media environment, then we'll also have a peaceful environment. Killed a that million a people in Iraq. That is a separate. You killed Ugh. a million people in Iraq. It's incredible that you have the brass neck to be sitting here now, urging another Iraq war. George, after if what I was still in done. Parliament, I. There can be no doubt that Saddam Hussein has biological weapons and the capability to rapidly produce more, many more. And he has the ability to dispense these lethal poisons and diseases in ways that can cause massive death and destruction. If biological weapons seem too terrible to contemplate, chemical weapons are equally chilling. Unmovic already laid out much of this and it is documented for all of us to read in UNSCOM's 1999 report on the subject. If we consider just one category of missing weaponry, 6,500 bombs from the Iran-Iraq war, UNMOVIC says the amount of chemical agent in them would be on the order of a thousand tons. These quantities of chemical weapons are now unaccounted for. Dr. Blick says, quipped that, quote, mustard gas is not normally. You are supposed to know what you did with it. We believe Saddam Hussein knows what he did with it, and he has not come clean to the international community. We have evidence these weapons existed. What we don't have is evidence from Iraq that they have been destroyed or where they are. That is what we are still waiting for. Okay, inspection worth doing, everybody's agreed it's worth doing, and it gets stopped. Yes, sir. At that moment, we're an automatic pilot as far as you're concerned. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, I respect that. 
But now, it seems to me the Secretary of State might have a slightly different problem. Secretary of State might be sitting there and saying, I look over there on that side. Now, I remember so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and and the 12 people on this side, they're all the ones that said they didn't want to use force. Now, I'm going to have to go tell the president now that we should, or Secretary Cohen, unleash whatever it takes to get it done. And our military assessment is the same as the majors. The major's assessment is, privately held but publicly acknowledged later, that airstrikes alone aren't going to do this. Saddam's not going to cave on this. So, now here's the deal. I recommended the president have at it and let the chips fall where they may. A reasonable position for the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State to take. But I respectfully suggest, Major, I respectfully suggest they have a responsibility slightly above your pay grade slightly above your pay grade to decide whether or not to take the nation to war alone or to take the nation to war partway or to take the nation to war half at, halfway that's a real tough decision that's why they get paid the big bucks that's why they get the limos and you don't i mean this sincerely i'm not trying to be flip because i think and that's why i said at the outset the reason why i'm glad you did what you did we should come to our milk. We should make a decision. But in terms of whether the Secretary of State has no more to consider than you do as the arms inspector, you didn't get in, didn't get my job done, get me in. Period. You made the deal, right? That's the deal. A deal's a deal. Get me in. Scott Ritter, I'm ready to go. It's not how it works. Now, maybe it should work that way. But I, wouldn't you acknowledge that if you were President of the United States or the Secretary of State, you'd sit there and say, now, okay, old Scotty boy didn't get in. We said he should get in. We want him to get in. It's important that he does get in. They're not going to let him in, so what are we going to do now? We know that France and Russia aren't going to be with us. We're quite confident China's not. We've already run those traps. They're not there. We're not sure where the United States Senate is, but have at it, boys. Go get them. And by the way, Scott and the boys say air power's not enough. I think it's a legitimate debate, Scott, or, uh, Major. I think it's a legitimate debate. But I don't think we should be putting it in the context of you have somebody up there at state saying, look, how can we weasel out of this agreement? We want to let this guy out there hanging. We're not, we're not this. It's a very practical political decision. Same kind of decision General Powell made. Same kind of decision President Bush made. Every president, every secretary of state has to do it. Like I said, they get paid more than you. Their job's a hell of a lot more complicated than yours. They may have made the wrong decision, and you brought it to light. We should address it. We should say straight up where we are, and we should do it. And for that, I thank you. But it's above your pay grade. after 9-11 I went through the Pentagon and one of the generals called me and he said sir you gotta come in and talk to me a sec he says we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq I said we're going to war with Iraq why he said I don't know <laughs> he said I guess they don't know what else to do he said I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists but we've got a good military and we can take down governments and uh, he said I guess if if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper. He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Hey 
everyone, Clayton here. The show is going to start at 4 p.m. Eastern time. I should remind you that we have a VIP community. It's our Redacted Rebel VIP community. Now, this show is totally free, what you're watching right now, right? You can subscribe here on YouTube and Rumble, totally free. But if you'd like to support independent journalism, uh, we are uh, run by you. Without you guys, we wouldn't be able to do this show. We wouldn't be able to hire the team that we have. We wouldn't be able to afford the servers that we have. We wouldn't be able to afford the reporters that we have, the team that we have. Uh, so you can support us by going to redacted.inc and on the right side of your screen, you'll see a VIP community button. Just click that and for the price of a cup of coffee once a month, uh, you can support us. We put out exclusive content, early interviews that no one else will see, live streams just for our VIP rebel community. So again, it's totally free to watch this show. But if you do want to support independent journalism, we would really appreciate it. Come on over to redacted.inc, click on that community button, and decide if you want to sign up or not. It's totally up to you. We thank you. And meanwhile, the show will start in just a few moments at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Whatever our hopes may be for the future, for reducing this threat or living with it, there is no escaping either the gravity or the totality of its challenge to our survival and to our security. A challenge that confronts us in unaccustomed ways in every sphere of human activity. This deadly challenge imposes upon our society two requirements of direct concern both to the press and to the president. Two requirements that may seem almost contradictory in tone, but which must be reconciled and fulfilled if we are to meet this national peril. I refer first to the need for far greater public information, and second, to the need for far greater official secrecy. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know.
Hey everybody, welcome into Redacted on this Thursday. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. So glad to have you all here on this show. We don't suffer fools and we cover the stories the mainstream media does not. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the squatter story because illegal immigrants have found a loophole in our system, which is, hey, when you're away, cats will play, we will take over your home. It's being done to the tune of thousands of homes. You think, oh, there's just like a five or six of these. No, no, no thousands of American homes being taken over by squatters. We're going to look at where this is happening and why the open border crisis is causing this mass chaos. Plus, the EPA is pushing electric vehicles on you with new stringent emissions. They're saying they're doing this for black people. Specifically, they're saying that. And so if you are against EVs, you're a racist. We're going to show you that. <laughs> Okay. Also, uh, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, teaming up to the tune of tens of billions of dollars, pushing a fake meat propaganda scam on all of us, getting us to eat fake meat. That's the plan. They don't want you eating real meat anymore. So I guess this is the plan that we're going to be looking at. So welcome in, everyone. Hope you guys are having a great Thursday. Welcome into Redacted. And thank you guys so much for subscribing to the channel and being a part of our community here um, every day when we're live. We really appreciate it. You can join us on Rumble. You can join us on YouTube and uh, on X as well. So if I am if, if I'm against EVs and I'm a racist. Yes, specifically. And okay. it's uh, carbon emissions and transportation that is killing black people. The okay. worst, the okay. worst, they say. All right. Yeah. Now, is the alter, like, if, if I like, if I like my forerunner, does that make me a white supremacist? I'm not yes. quite sure. Yeah, no, you're, that would be the opposite. What does that make me? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, you're, yeah you you're, hate, you hate black people. You're a racist for having and, a And brown people, they say. Right. Exactly oh, that. Although I'm disappointed. I'm very disappointed in myself. I know. <laughs> yeah. How did you, how did we hire a racist? I don't know. My gosh. Although I will say yesterday's prepper video that we did about how people of color are also preppers and the media is shocked about it. They say, oh, it must be because of Trump. Uh, the comments, I spent probably a good half hour reading the comments on that video, and I was so heartened at just how racist preppers are not. What a welcoming community. I just loved it. It was over my morning cup of coffee this morning. I'm like, these are really good people. They don't care at all about skin color. They want everybody to have some canned food in their basement. As, yeah, a bunch of a uh, bunch of black preppers in the comments were like, yeah, you know, I've been I've been prepping since I was from childhood. Like, where have you guys been? Like. Going back to Jim Crow, we've been prepping our whole lives. Like, what is this? This is it not new information. It has nothing to do with skin color at all. It has to do with a universal commonality of wanting to protect your family and thinking about an uncertain future. Yeah. Yeah, the so, knitting community is the same way. Are they? They're so, yeah. they're so soft. They're so nice, those knitting <laughs> community. All right, let's talk about this, shall we? Because imagine this. One day you wake up. And, you know, you make breakfast, you head to the airport, kiss your family goodbye. Uh, you're going on a work trip, right? Maybe they're coming with you. I don't know. You come they home. They have to come with you. They'd have to come with scenario. you in this scenario. I guess I guess I didn't think about it. So let's let, let me role play this again. So imagine this. You wake up, you take the family on a short vacation. Maybe you're working. But anyway, you leave your house for a few days. OK. And a few days later, you come home to find out there's illegal aliens uh, living in your home, sleeping in your bed. Then you call the police because you think that's the right thing to do. Right. To get them get this person out of my house. But thanks to squatters rights and thanks to an incompetent prosecution system right now, uh, the police can't do anything about it. And you're arrested for trespassing on your own home. That's exactly what's happening right now. Illegals know this, and it's happening all over the United States. This is not some isolated incident. Many states have very lax squatters laws. Uh, every state is different. Uh, and illegal aliens are spreading this information to tell other illegal immigrants to find a vacant house and or one that has like a sign up like for rent. If you move in, guess what? You get to claim rights on that house, claiming squatters' rights. Here's one. Uh, this illegal immigrant posted this, and this has gone viral overnight, claiming that his friends have already taken over seven houses and alerting other illegal immigrants, do this in the United States. Mi gente, he pensado invadir una casa en Junei State. Ya que me enteré que existe una ley que dice que si una casa... No está habitada. Podemos expropiarla. Capichi, muchachos, aquí en Yunei State también se aplica la de invasión de terreno. Y creo que ese será mi próximo negocio. 
invadir casas abandonadas, ya que me he buscado unos códigos con mis amigos africanos y me dijeron que ya llevan como siete casas expropiadas. Y como dice el dicho, papi, hay que buscar la vuelta. Y la vuelta ahorita mismo es invadir casas, ya que nos encontramos en situación de calle y es la única manera que tenemos para no vivir en la calle y no ser una carga pública. Capichi, la ley dice que las casas abandonadas, deterioradas y que esté en mal estado, podemos llegar y repararlas, vivir en ella y si podemos venderla, hasta pedir créditos con ella. ¿Qué dicen ustedes? Ya. Yeah. That's true. They teach you that in real estate school. Right. I have and a real estate license. You have a real estate license. This was taught. You can study this in New Jersey, where you got it, New Jersey specifically. Uh, but this is all over the United States, and every state's laws are different. So w did he say anything inaccurate there? No. And in fact, one of the most lenient states for squatters' rights to become property owners is Texas. It okay. has one of the shortest um, habitation, habitation laws. Yeah, and so does California. Yeah. So... But here's the thing, right? So forget the laws for a second. Forget like squatters laws, because some of you might be lawyers out there. And you might be saying, yeah, but the laws are this five years. You have to be in the property, et cetera. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter at all, actually, what the squatters laws are, because these individuals can take over these homes. And the prosecution right now is so lax. The police force is not dealing with this. And this is not even rising up to the level of anything that they're concerned about. So forget even the laws. They're just living in homes and can take over these homes and you have no recourse about it. The New York Post reports that over 1,200 homes have already been taken over by squatters in the Atlanta area, turning homes into drug dens, strip clubs, and more. Squatters take over 1,200 homes in Atlanta. Illegal strip clubs, terrorized neighborhoods. Is this even America? The New York Post headline says. One homeowner came home, didn't know what to do, and he saw prostitutes in his home. He just ran out of there. I didn't walk in on a family eating dinner. I walked in on weapons, a prostitute, a bunch of dogs in the back. I just jumped the fence and ran. I didn't, I didn't know what else to do. I mean, imagine that he can like laugh about it or I mean, because what else are you going to do? I mean, because so, he lived to tell. Yeah. Yeah. They could have they could have shot him or so or, you know, who knows? Right. In another well, incident. Man. You go ahead, Phil. Go ahead, David. Well, I was going to say, they, they encourage people to use the court system to take care of this. But a lot of these, like some of these people are just, it's like an investment property that to be a little bit extra income and, and, and some kind of, you know, thing for their, their legacy. And they can't afford to go through the court system. But that's like the, the only thing they say, oh, just take them to court. But yeah. Like, but, okay, yeah. And then what happens? It's, it's, right. So then what happens in the months that you're taking someone to court? You have no rights to that home. You're trespassing on that home. In New Jersey... We had a renter who had not paid rent in two years and couldn't even get her off the property. And we owned it. She had a lease that she had not paid. And I still could not get the police to enforce to evict her. Yeah. No matter what. right? And we so had to, to use get... lawyers, go through the whole process. Yeah, through it an was eviction super process. expensive and stressful. And that's a typical eviction process. Right. Right. So what they're saying is don't even sign a lease. Don't, don't even use the normal eviction process. Don't use a lease. Don't get a lease. Don't sign a lease. Just break into the house. Well, my point is, if you can't even evict formal renters, and then you absolutely are not going to be able to evict someone who's not. Um, and a new report today shows that at least 200,000 migrant deportation cases were thrown out just because the U.S. didn't properly file its paperwork. Wazowski. So you think that, you know, we're going to be able to enforce laws, squatters laws, when we can't even properly enforced deportation cases? Of course not. Uh, you know, as J.J. Carroll pointed out on our show yesterday, they're not vetting any of these individuals. They, the system is com completely overwhelmed. They're not doing any of this. You think they have some sort of proper paperwork? No, they don't have any of this. In another incident, U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dahlia Dower was on deployment, came home to her home, and found convicted criminals squatting in her home. Oh, that's way to protect veterans while they go overseas. So they're overseas. Us. Yes, they're overseas on deployment. They come home and their home is literally taken over by an invasion army. Like, can you think about, just think about the irony in that for a moment. That's wild. 
Now, this is happening all over the country. Here's Houston. A group of trespassers is living in a Houston woman's home, and she doesn't know how to get them out. That house was listed for lease, but when some prospective tenants went for a visit last week, they found a group of people living inside. Yeah, it's going to make it difficult for you to lease that home. And so this is the strategy, right? Find these homes that are listed for rent, I guess, listed for lease. Call up your illegal immigrant friends and say, hey, 123 Main Street, you know, let's, let's smash in the window. Let's kick in the door. Let's move in. And now that property is under their control. Even and if you are somehow able to get them out with the county sheriff or something, we know as when we've had squatters in properties that we have been in between renters before, they mess it up completely. They don't take good care of it. We've had just thousands of dollars in damages before someone pooped in the vents. And we had to get specific types of cleaners in there to remember that. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. So they're going to destroy the property. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly what's going to happen. They're going to destroy the property. And, you know, the United States has a uh, housing crisis to begin with. There's not enough homes in the United States for Americans. We need three million units, three million homes just for Americans, not illegal immigrants. Homeowners or builders have been slowed down. Thank you know the pandemic slowed everything down, right? So they couldn't build, couldn't get materials, and now that they finally got caught back up again, of course we have higher interest rates. Now we've got an economy that's you know uh, clamped down for for millennials that can't afford homes. So we we have a housing crisis. We have an affordable housing crisis in the United States to begin with. Now on top of it, add in a layer of illegal immigrants who need a place to live. The government truly hates property owners. They hate you. Apparently, even though, you know, even though the tax code is written to benefit property owners, right? The idea of the American dream. But forget it. Maryland, same thing. Maryland residents come home, find out squatters living in her bedroom, catches them on camera. They sold off all like all of her private belongings, $49,000 in stuff that they cleaned out of the house and sold. And she there confronts them like right in the house. And, uh, Finally, it's like they they wake up and they're sleeping in the middle of the afternoon. And, and then I guess they left. But nevertheless, forty nine thousand dollars in material uh, sold off. Um, a woman in Maryland came home from vacation, found squatters sleeping in her bed. And again, you know, can you imagine that walking in and seeing these people just asleep in your bed? No, I would freak. I mean, I would do worse than that beyond just freak. And I certainly wouldn't run away. Uh, this video, of course, over the past 48 hours has gone viral. This is an unbelievable story of a woman who's like going to confront them, calls the police like there's squatters in this property. And then she, the owner, gets arrested for trespassing on her own property. Here, This guy just forced himself into my house. No, he did not. Yes, he did. No, he did. And he so did you. Man. You broke through the front door. Officer. The man called the police on her. So why is it that I have to leave and he doesn't have to leave? Because technically he can't be kicked out. He needs to go to court. They consider this a landlord-tenant issue. And by law, it has to be handled through the housing court, not with police. Dell, you're getting arrested right now? I'm being arrested. For what? For being, for being, in, my, house, for being in my own home. That's crazy. This is America. A what the hell is happening? Issue? Yeah. And again, this is the issue, right? Well, we don't know. We don't know. There's a landlord tenant issue. You got to deal with it in the court system. And so they know how to play the game. They know how to play the game, which is to take advantage of this whole process right now. So well, in the meantime, we can literally be going back and forth with lawyers. If they have lawyers, they have some sort of an immigration attorney. Who knows? Back and forth, back and forth. This can happen for months, if not years. And this person who owns the home is out of, of a home that they either rent out or even live in because they were on vacation. Go ahead, David. Well, I said they got through with a loophole on this one because they like they were trying to get them to produce a lease. They didn't have one. And he produced a bill of something that he had paid for that had that address on it. So that was all the cops needed. Yeah. Well, if, yeah, exa exactly. So they could show some sort of paperwork if they have something that they can show where they can lay claim to the property. And again, I come back to the, if you want to come back to the purely squatters rights laws, right, that you would learn about in real estate school that are on the books. I've covered stories like this back when I was at Fox. I interviewed people who were, Florida had very lax, it seemed like at the time, squatters laws where people just could go into a home and it was almost impossible for the banks to get them out of there. They couldn't get these people out of there. Yeah. 
Uh, and so, yeah, just based purely on the laws itself, it's keeping these people in these homes. Right. And you have no recourse. Yeah, um, I, had, I had a... I had a, a, a teammate, a pool teammate that uh, he was he was homeless, basically had to live with his girlfriend for well over a year because he had rented a room out to somebody. And that guy filed a restraining order uh, on him, ended up with the house. So the guy that owned the house, because he just rented a room to somebody and that guy like got a restraining order. He couldn't go into his own house uh, for well over a year. So he had to live at his girlfriend because the, and that guy just lived there. And and the courts were just like, no, it's, it's it, 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 yeah, I mean, just, just we, for renting a room out. Now, in America, it. forget the illegal immigrant part of it. Like what you just described is what we would call in the real estate world, like a professional tenant, like yes. someone who knows how to game the system. Right. And so the move in, not pay rent and then like go through the eviction process. But they don't care. They'll just keep like going back and forth, back and forth, getting like. You know, paperwork. They just signed. buy themselves time yeah. to hop from place to place, and as soon as they get another place, then they know they've got at least two years before an eviction is filed. And they can they can break into a home, show fake paperwork. Now they're now they're technically a tenant in this new house. They don't even have paperwork. They never actually signed a lease, but they're taking advantage of the system. So this is all back to the open border and Mexico saying, uh, you know, you guys have this open border on your side. This is allowing this to flow unless you unless you close it down. This is going to continue to flow into Biden's America. Caught on camera, the moment migrants made a run to the border. You can hear people cheering, whistling and celebrating that they can see their end goal in sight. El Paso. You can hear migrants chanting, we are united, and one migrant telling the cameras, quote, we're not doing anything to you, end quote. Francisco Guarduño is the migration delegate on the Mexican side of the border, and he says migrants making their way to the southern border will always be an issue if the United States continue to allow their open border policy. As long as the United States continues to open the doors of its border and exceptionally allow passage to some groups, families, minors, vulnerable people, it is a call for more migrants to come. Over the last couple of weeks, migrants have been riding on top of freight trains from central to northern Mexico as they make their way to the southern border. So uh, the USA Today has also broken down a number of these states where this is all happening. Um, and to hear it from the USA Today, which, of course, is a liberal rag and an awful newspaper. But in this situation, they've actually cataloged exactly how this has unfolded. So prosecutors and politicians play a critical role in these scams. Local authorities have done little to assist homeowners for a variety of reasons, from political calculations to negligence. Instead, they force landowners to go into overtaxed housing courts Exactly right. And notoriously slow dockets. It often takes months or years to get an eviction order. So they know how to play these games. Right. And they're telling them, well, we can't deal with it. So you just go and figure it out, figure it out through the court system. Uh, no prosecution as well, because the people involving involved in committing crimes from breaking and entering to fraud to forgery, yet they're rarely prosecuted. Squatting is not a particularly difficult problem to solve. It simply requires police and prosecutors to enforce existing laws but they can't. And most of them are undocumented, so you can't put this on their record. So if they then go to get another place or it won't show up on any record of behavior at all, it's not trackable. And the problem is exactly once they actually start signing leases and become trackable, that's the problem. So they're being encouraged to not sign sign any of this stuff, yeah. like don't have a paper trail, essentially just move into these houses. The common nuisance of squatting, the USA Today writes. Um, it reflects a breakdown in basic deterrence of our laws. Property offenses have been steadily downgraded as priorities in many cities, while prosecutions are viewed as politically risky for officials who do not want to be viewed as targeting people who are homeless. I thought we're not supposed to call them homeless anymore. We're supposed to call them the unhoused, but okay. I don't know. It's but you know, it's not just happening in the United States like Europe. If you think you're free from this, you're not. Squatters have been occupying buildings throughout Europe doing the same thing in protest. This was a story uh, in Berlin where squatters occupying a series of buildings in Berlin saying, you know, we, uh, we, we were taking over these residential buildings, um, you know, and we don't we can't afford to live here. So we're just going to take over these buildings. You can't do anything about it. So it's happening in Europe as well. 
and there's really no like what's the what's a way to prevent it like what is something a people could do to prevent it i don't think there is anything other than uh, do not leave your home well i mean you get a security system for one you know that way you can be there to stop it happening right um another, i'm thinking a pit bull yeah get it's my next thought. get a dog get <laughs> yeah. a, get a dog get a gun uh, arm yourself make sure you know um and yeah protect yourself band together as a community you know, this is the importance of uh, neighbors having a strong community, neighbors keeping an eye out on properties. You know, hey, you're gone. Mm -hmm. Let your neighbors know that you're going to be traveling for the next few days on business. Like keep an eye out on our house. If you notice anything weird. Right. You know, um, step in, do what you can do. But it's it's unbelievable. But a lot of this is, you know, flowing right from Mexico. And I just co-authored a new report on this specifically. Uh, some of the things we talk about in this report, we cannot talk about on YouTube. They're not happy with it. Um, and it literally is how the U.S. government nonprofit organizations are banding together these NGOs, working with these Mexican cartels and human traffickers and flowing right into the United States. So you can go grab this free report um, I encourage all of you to read it. You can share it with people who don't know what's going on. Just go to redacted.inc slash Mexico. It's unbelievable. And the Biden administration is totally facilitating this right under our noses and in order to bring in additional voters mm -hmm. and to de completely destabilize the United States. I have a few other ideas because I watched Home Alone for how to make sure that this doesn't happen to your house. Get some, um, put some tacks on the ground. Some glue and nails facing upwards on your stairs. Yeah. In, in case Joe Pesci breaks in. Right. Yeah, but actually, I think I, I've actually heard about, uh, like stories, read stories of that though, where, where people have booby trapped their house for something like that and they go to jail. Yes. But that's <laughs> Kevin McAllister to, to booby trap would property. not be safe in it's, the year 2024. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy, right? You try to protect your own house and you and you're not there and someone breaks in and you get in trouble for it. I mean, you're in trouble for trespassing on your own property, kicking some of these people out. Yeah, uh, they got to change these laws. I mean, another way, David, to answer David's question, we've got to force these these states to change their laws on mm -hmm. on the you know, on the books and also have prosecution to, and have enough money going into prosecution teams and law enforcement to stop this. When yeah. you defund the police and you pull back on prosecutions and you push this aside like, oh, this is just a housing court issue. Right. Uh, no, it's not. It's not a house. This is a crime. Yeah, and it's not just white people that are being pushed out of their home so we can celebrate because it's the end of colonialism. Like these are we black you, people, we Latin you black people. people. Yeah, yeah like, literally having their homes it's taken everybody. over. Everybody, it's not a racial issue here. It's about the fact that it, it, it seems true that globalists want you to own nothing and they don't have respect for your private property uh, because owning something means they own. If you know, if you own nothing, they own you. Yeah. And that's what we're moving towards. So let us know what you think of this. Well, the Biden administration is pushing electric vehicles on you and they're doing it for black people. Or so they say they are literally saying this. The EPA made an announcement about major emissions limits, which push car makers to make more EVs, even if they don't want to, which they don't. And the Biden administration saying this is all being done in the name of racial justice. Here yesterday, the EPA made this announcement in Washington and they had an NAACP and environmental justice organizer named Asada Rashidi. She kicked off this announcement and made it very clear that this is is all about the health of black and brown people. Today marks a positive step forward in protecting communities like mine and paving the way for a healthier and sustainable future where black and brown families can thrive. And at this time, I am honored to have the opportunity to introduce Michael S. Regan, the 16th Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency the first black man and the second person of color to ever lead the EPA. All right, this was an exciting event, you can tell. Wow. Now, they are it's like a race, Biden. yeah, they're race baiting you into accepting EVs. And the implication is if you don't accept EVs, you don't care about communities of color. What she says then is that because she comes from Newark, and Newark is a polluted crap hole. It is. We used to live in Essex County. Uh, her family suffered from ill health, which I don't doubt. Poor communities do, in fact, suffer more ill health and racial minorities are more likely to live in those communities. But the EPA is then making the leap that if there were more electric vehicles in her Newark neighborhood, her family would have better health. Not accounting for 
oh, what food is in lower income communities? Uh, what education is there, right? Nothing else matters. It's just that her brothers must have asthma because they live near an airport. The arsenic and lead that's in Essex County oh water. Oh my God, the water there the water absolutely source. is the worst in the country. Yeah, Essex County has the worst water source. So, But and she's concerned fact, about electric vehicles. Right, and in fact, uh, officials in Essex County went to jail for falsifying the chemicals in the water. So, okay, none of that is true, right? Just she they're using her to pretend they can solve one thing and make Newark a better place to live. Except Newark is run on gas-powered plants, so more EVs in that neighborhood would be plugged into this gas-powered plant, which would not reduce air pollution. It would increase it, would increase it in fact. Um, and economists know that you can improve the health and environment of low-income groups by increasing their overall wealth, by increasing GDP overall, and quality of life. In fact, you can't just pick one thing and try to improve it. You have to focus on overall improvement of life. So this is not re this is not how you stand up for racism, just choosing one thing. Here's Bjorn Lumberg's book saying, on the most basic level, a nation with higher GDP per person is likely to have citizens who live longer. People and the state can afford better health care, nutrition and safety and have a host of other advantages that reduce death risks. It's not just because there are gas powered cars. So high GDP per person correlates to higher education rates and lower child mortality because families and communities can afford better education and better health care to prevent and treat disease. So they're baiting us. They're race baiting us with this EV announcement. And if being against an EV makes you a racist. Okay, I don't know if you want to accept that or not, but let's take a look at what they're trying to do. I mean, just imagine the hardworking people of Newark who then have their economy screech to a halt because they can't make deliveries. They, ha they can't take a job call. They can't get deliveries of the things that they need to run their business. Uh, that's racist, I think if you really want to break it down, but okay. Um, and Newark won't be getting a growing economy because climate activists shut down an additional power plant. So we don't really care if their economy grows at all. Now, affordable energy, of course, raises the quality of life, period. And yet the EPA is moving forward with this, trying to just screech the economy to a halt with electric vehicles. Here are the new emission standards that will inevitably make it harder to buy a gas-powered car in the non not too distant future. They're calling it the strongest ever pollution standards, and many are calling it a cover to eliminate gas-powered cars. And in fact, it limits the amount of carbon that, that each car can have per mile by 2027, and since gas-powered cars just can't meet those standards yet, it would mean that car companies then have to make more EVs to average it out. Here's what the Wall Street Journal said, uh, saying that, for instance, a gas-powered pickup emits 430 grams of carbon per mile, but under this rule, trucks will have to average 184 grams per mile in 2027, and then it reduces from there. So then the companies will effectively have to produce one to two electric trucks for every gas-powered one in 2027. The ratio will be closer to four to one in 2032. They're calling this preserving of consumer choice, but how can it be when the only choice will be electric, except they can make these four to one EVs to gas power cars? That doesn't mean people will buy them. We see right now people are just not. In fact, the journal says that EVs made up less than 8% of new car sales last year, half of which, so a full 4% was Tesla. And Tesla is not, Tesla is a, a vanity purchase. People are not necessarily buying it because they love EVs. Um, and that's what a group of car dealers told the Biden administration last November when they said, please stop the EV mandates. We cannot sell them. Here is a video we showed you last year of Tom Maioli from Celebrity Motor Car, one of the dealers who signed this letter explaining just how they're sitting on the lots to CNBC. And this is basically the voice of the consumer. This is not the dealer. This is the voice of the consumer. And what's happening is the manufacturer is being forced to produce these EVs. They're shipping them to the dealerships and they're backing up on the lots. You know, our, our average day supply pre-COVID was 60 to 90 days supply of inventory. During COVID, it was less than 30 because of the supply chain issues. We're now backed up up to 12 months with EVs. 
Consumers don't want them. They're not buying them. We have up to $15,000 in rebates from the manufacturer yeah. and $7,500 tax credits. We're talking $22,500. You, you, that's crazy. And right, we heard all about this during COVID, how, oh my gosh, you, car prices, used cars. There was such a demand for cars. We need these cars. Everyone wants a car. And now we have so many of them. And no one wants them. Right. There should be a it should be a wake up call for people. We saw this, of course, in Canada, where Pierre Polyev is saying on the conservative side, no, you have we're seeing this fleet of electric vans and emergency vehicles and so forth that you're trying to turn into, and then a deep freeze occurs and they don't work. Yeah. Or the battery life is co severely constrained by cold weather. Yeah. Right. The technology is not there, and then of course the infrastructure and the grid technology is all a sham to begin with. Right. And it very much matters how they're charged. And we don't have clean energy right now because the United States doesn't give that much of a care about nuclear energy, which could, in fact, power these cars cleanly, but they choose not to. House Speaker Mike Johnson called this new EPA rule misguided. He said this is another radical anti-energy crusade that will limit consumer choices raise costs on American families, and devastate auto manufacturers. More regulation and higher costs are the opposite of what our country needs to do. And so he's urging the Biden administration to reverse course immediately. And, you know, I know that whatever you're going to cast your vote for this election season is probably not electric vehicles or not, but it does make this an election year issue because undoubtedly President Trump will repeal these rules. Uh, President Biden will leave them in place. So let us know how much this weighs into your choices this year, how much you, how much you care about this, what you think. Um, because, yeah, this is a... We'll see. Well, yeah, and President Trump the other day, of course, in his bloodbath comments talking about the American auto industry and how important it is for us to build up the American auto industry and get back to a level of prominence again instead of relying on Chinese and uh, flooding through Mexico and all of this stuff. So, um, I, you know, President Trump's already vowed to roll back a huge percentage of these green initiatives, mm -hmm. which is just a big, massive boondoggle for Wall Street. It has nothing to do with actually helping America in any capacity. Clearly not. So anyway, let us know your thoughts on that. Okay, we've got more news to get to on your Thursday. We're going to look at the Fed. So I don't know if you noticed overnight, gold prices have hit a new all-time high. The highest it's ever been overnight, over $2,200 an ounce for gold right now. The Fed Chief Jerome Powell speaking yesterday saying we're going to have three interest rate cuts in this year, but also admitting some stuff kind of under his breath about inflation. So this like stickiness of inflation is here to stay, perhaps, and not going to be near this 2% target anymore. Uh, Kevin Demerit from Lear is going to join us. We're going to talk about gold. We're going to talk about what does this mean for, the, for American jobs. And we're also going to talk about what it means for the American economy, because the Biden administration keeps telling us we're in a best, we're in the best economy we've seen ever. Well, how, why, where's this disconnect with American workers right now who can't afford rent and groceries are still skyrocketing. So there's a huge disconnect, maybe the crushing of the middle class. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first we want to tell you about our show sponsor over at Aura, because if you are inundated with an overwhelming number of spam calls and spam emails may feel like an invasion by unknown companies trying to tell you things you don't want or scam you. It's exhausting, I know, but it turns out that data brokers are selling your personal information and making a fortune from it, so they're doing it on purpose. That's your name, home address, health records, your relatives, your full name, all of that stuff. Aura is a game changer, though. They're not just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. They're getting the root of it and pulling it out. Aura doesn't just block spam calls and emails. They go to the source and stop these data brokers from selling your information from the first place. If you've ever tried to manually opt out of data broker lists, you know it can be difficult and lengthy. Uh, this is just a bunch of other features. This is one of many features that they offer, like antivirus, VPN, password management, and even identity theft insurance. All of this bundled into one simple, affordable package. So please try them out. You can get a two-week free trial by going to our link. It's aura.com slash redacted. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash redacted. Can't hurt to check them out. Get a two-week free trial. Also, you can click the link below uh, the description of this video. So give it a shot and take back your privacy with aura.com slash redacted.
Well, the most powerful man in America is a man by the name of Jerome Powell. He's an unelected central banker, and he just spoke yesterday about what the Fed intends to do, uh, either you know get us out of a recession or put us right in the middle of one. Inflation has eased substantially while the labor market has remained strong, and that is very good news. But inflation is still too high. So on those words, gold skyrocketed to an all-time high, and last night the stock market also hit new highs across the board. Rally was the name of the day. So what's really going on here? Kevin Demerit is the CEO of Lear Capital. We'd like to check in with Kevin uh, every few months to see what's going on in this economy. Kevin, good to see you. Good to be back, Clayton. So an interesting day because I feel like we're in the moment really of have and have nots right now. You have a lot of people saying, I can't rub two pennies together right now. I can't rub two nickels together right now to be able to afford my rent. My grocery bills are going up. I'm paying more for just about everything. Jerome Powell yesterday admitting basically that eh, inflation targets of 2% not going to happen. <laughs> like we're cutting, throwing the towel in on that. It's going to be higher. But yet we're hearing from the Biden administration that this is a booming economy, that everything is great. So there really seems to be a total disconnect here. What did you make of Powell's comments yesterday? Well, I think he's absolutely um, on track as far as you, you're probably going to have to lower interest rates sooner rather than, than later. Uh, so I, I think he's predicting three uh, decreases in interest rates. He sees a recession coming. And so do a lot of billionaires and the people that I'm speaking to. There is a recession coming. If you look at the statistics and the indicators that usually will tell you if a, a recession is coming, like an inverted yield curve with a 100% uh, track record of being correct, um, there's a recession coming. On top of that, there's a couple of other indicators that I think Jerome Powell is really looking at, what, one being the money supply. Look, money is like gas in a car. You need it to run the economy. So if you get a pullback in, M2, where the money supply M2, which is really money in a checking account, your savings account, and uh, certificates of deposit, um, money markets, things like that. Okay, so that's that's M2. You don't see it shrink usually, Clayton. It, it, it doesn't come down too much. But when it comes down just a couple of percent, it has large ramifications. And it's only come down the, that 2 percent four times in the last 150 years. And each time that it's done that, there's been a recession or a depression and double digit unemployment. Okay, so that's one. Wow. The other is commercial bank lending. When commercial bank lending decreases by 2% or more, which has only happened three times since 1973, you get a recession. So not only do we have an inverted yield curve with a 100% predictability rate, we have commercial lending off by more than 2%, and we have the M2 money supply off by more than 2%. It's a scary situation for him because that usually signals a big recession, depression, 2008. Something big usually comes when all three of those indicators are going in the wrong direction. And we see, of course, also hiring. Hiring has been slowing a lot of small businesses now saying that uh, we, you know, when you had people quitting, the quit index, right? So a lot of people saying they're going to quit and they could usually then go and get another job. But now a lot of small businesses saying they're just, they're pulling back on a lot of hiring right now, which is also incredibly troubling. You talk about the inverted yield curve, which for, for our audience, maybe they don't understand exactly what that is. It's what bond investors are expecting, right? In terms of long-term, uh, long-term interest rates and longer term interest rates. So a lot of the people that would be investing in these longer term bonds are saying we see trouble on the horizon. Yeah, basically an inverted yield curve means that the longer end of the curve, so 30 years out, is actually lower. They're paying less interest than the current one year, two year notes. So what that's really saying is the long term guys, the long term bond guys think hey, there's a recession coming, he's gonna to have to lower interest rates. So we're betting that interest rates are gonna be lower out longer dated than where we are today. That's what usually signals a recession. And bond guys in my world are much smarter than the stock guys. They really have to pay attention to the economy. They're just debt to corporations, the government debt, so on and so forth. So they, they're paying much 
better attention. They don't get so caught up in the frenzy and the buying uh, at all time highs like we're starting to see in the stock market right now. So much smarter guys, in my opinion. I mean, so Powell really seemed, I mean, he's he's walking a fence here. I mean, really seems like you want to, the ultimate fence walking, tightrope walking moment right now because, but you know, the Biden administration, of course, absolutely does not want a recession. So pressuring, pressuring the Fed, we've got to cut interest rates. We've got to allow people to get in their homes, buy, you know, buy real estate, pay less for a car, all of that. We've got cars sitting on the lots right now. People can't afford them. People are swimming in credit card debt. And yet the Biden administration telling us everything is, is, is golden. I think in the commercial real estate, I think you bring up a great point. You have so much in the commercial real estate market right now is crumbling. And a lot of these small banks, you're talking to seeing small banks folding as well, right? Because they can't, I mean, they're, they're, these loans are coming due and no one's going back to work. They're not going in these office buildings. Yeah, you, you, there, there's going to be another, uh, there's going to be another bank crisis, in my personal opinion. It's not just me. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people out there talking about a bank crisis, but there's one and a half trillion dollars of commercial real estate maturing by the end of 2025. Uh, I just, I just ran this report on the debt maturing in the next 18 months. You have New York, which tops the list at about 40 billion dollars, and th and this is, these are loans that are horrible. They're high risk loans and, and they're probably default. They'll, they'll probably default. So New York's about 40 billion. Los Angeles is 18 billion. Miami at 13 billion. Vegas at 10 billion. San Francisco at about 12 billion. You have a lot of these loans. My building that I'm in right now is 20% vacant. If they go and try to get a, a, a bank loan on this thing, they couldn't do it. The, the vacancy rate is too high for the bank to give a loan at the same loan value that is on this building today. So they're going to have to come up with whatever it is, uh, 300, 400 million dollars, uh, you know, some number to drop, you know, the, the, the value of the loan and you can't do it. And so these banks are stuck. I don't know what they're going to do, but some of them are going to go out of business and there's going to be a lot of consolidation in the banking industry in the next year and a half, in my opinion. So I, think commercial you're, real estate company. I think you're right about that. I think a lot of these small banks are going to be gobbled up. They're going to be gobbled up by the big boys, which is exactly what they want. It's all part of their plan. And I think, you know, I, I'm saying this, and this may sound like a conspiracy theory to people, but we're moving towards a digital currency and they want to, they want this money supply to be tight. So there's not actual currency floating around out there. They want to be able to control the currency. They can print as much of it as they want. And they want to move us towards a digital currency. And I think, is that why you think we're, we're seeing gold hitting an all-time high? Like, what do you think accounts for this huge move into gold and silver right now? Yeah, I think there's 34 trillion reasons that, uh, you know, the gold market is at all-time highs. But on top of that, you have Mark Zuckerberg sold half a billion dollars worth of his stock. Jeff Bezos is selling his stock. Warren Buffett has sold $168 billion or has $168 billion in cash ready to deploy because he's afraid to deploy it at this particular point. Michael Dell has a half a billion that he sold. And Jamie Dimon, for the first time in 18 years, has sold JP Morgan stock. First time in 18 years. The top pick at JP Morgan in the commodity section is gold, predicting at $2,500 an ounce. That's about 12% higher than we trade at today. And if you look at the debt, Clayton, People are afraid of the debt. They can't, you know, it's it's unfathomable that we are printing a trillion dollars every 100 days. So there are a lot of different reasons that people are nervous about the economy and uh, piling into gold and piling into the Bitcoin, which is skyrocketing along with it. A hundred days, we're adding another trillion. I mean, we have the debt clock that we keep above us here on the show, on the set, you know, shows our national debt. So a hundred, a hundred days is adding a trillion dollars. I remember when I was in high school many moons ago, back in the early 1990s and hearing about the debt and we were approaching a certain level of trillion and we were trying to all wrap our heads around it in my social studies class. And now we're adding that every hundred days. Yeah. You know, to give people some sort of an indication here, a trillion seconds is 31 years. At the end of this year, we are going to add a hundred years of debt at a trillion dollars, uh, you know, it, 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 every hundred days. It, it is unfathomable. You. They're printing money so uh, like it's water out there. I, I, I just don't understand how people uh, are not more nervous 
uh, about moving their money over to hard assets, the real estate market, the commodity, or, you know, gold and silver, or the real yeah. estate market. I mean, you cannot hold paper money at this particular point. I hope people are paying attention. We've been saying this for years on this show. I've been trying to educate people about it. Owning real estate, owning gold, owning silver, owning actual tangible assets, hard assets, which have been around for 5,000 years as a currency, as a way of doing business, right? Going back to the Roman Empire, for crying out loud, owning real estate, gold and silver. So it's it's survived all manners of governments collapsing and every fiat currency in world history has collapsed. What makes people think the U.S. dollar is not going to be in that pile of rubble? Um, I mean, what do you say? I see people commenting from time to time and saying, you know, well, yeah, the gold market, though, is manipulated just like the rest of it. You know, the gold market's manipulated. So can you really put your money in hard assets like that? What if I need to sell it? What if I need to? And I always remind people, you know, Natalie and I are big investors in gold and silver. If I need to sell it for some other reason... I can do it within a few days. Like it's held off site in a storage facility. I can sell it in a few days and it's it's converted and I can make a transaction, right? Absolutely. I mean, gold's the most liquid investment on, on the entire planet. If I'm in Hong Kong or England or here in the United States or over in Portugal, the gold is worth what it's worth. I can sell it anywhere at any time. You can't do that with a piece of real estate. You can sell it in the United States, but it's tough to sell someplace else. You can't do that with diamonds. You have to go get them assayed all over again. You can't do that with, you know, stock a lot of times. So yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly liquid. And when we saw 2008 and, and, and some of these corrections, that's what people used as it was moving up as a hedge to then go buy stocks at lower prices or real estate at lower prices. It gave them the liquidity that they needed uh, in times when liquidity wasn't there for them, especially on the real estate side, uh, Clayton. 2008, we have a lot of real estate investors, as you know, and uh, you know, either A, they had a tough time paying because people weren't paying them their rent, so they used precious metals as a way to liquidate that and, and, and pay the mortgage, or you know, some of the guys that had great pieces of real estate and people were paying, when the real estate fell, they used the gold to go out and buy real estate when gold was high and real estate was low, so incredibly liquid. Well, I'll get you out of here on this, Kevin. I know we've been talking about target prices for gold. So as an investor, I'm excited. The idea Bank of America, I think, has a, a, a $3,000 price target for gold. Maybe it's higher than that. You just mentioned Goldman Sachs. You guys have you guys put together a $3,200 gold report that people can get if they go to learedacted.com. You've made it available for our audience and people want to read about price targets. Can you talk a little bit about what's why you're seeing this this over three thousand dollar price target for gold? Yeah, so if you look at the the debt, and we we look at correlations, right? No different than the inverted yield curve or the the money supply and the commercial credit that we were talking about. You're looking for things that are predictable. So there's a ninety two percent predictability rate of where the U.S. debt stands and where the gold price stands, and that. That is a 92% correlation. Where we are today, the price of gold should trade at $3,200. So if you look over history, if gold's higher than that correlation, it's a good time to sell it. If it's lower than that correlation, then it's a good time to usually purchase. So you look back in you know, 2018, 2019, when gold kind of skyrocketed and, and was up in the $2,000 range, you know, it should have been in the 2000s or uh, 1600s, $1,700 range, good time to sell and it did pull back. So this correlation is explained in our, in our package of information so people can understand it because you want that kind of predictability with your investing, right? We wanna buy low, sell high. So that's in there and they can give us a phone call or go to learedacted.com. Um, it's debt and $3,200 gold. We have our gold investors kit so people can understand how to take physical delivery, how to sell, how to store it if they would like to store it, and even how to move their IRA over to physical gold if they would like to do that, their IRA or the 401k. And then we have some fun, you know, I always love to be on the program and, and do something fun with your audience. So we have a fun gift, which is the old $1 silver certificate. So I bought a bunch of silver, old silver Morgan dollars uh, that I love, and uh, th there was 50 silver certificates in there. And it was way back when the dollar was actually backed by silver. So look, they're worth $5 a piece. It's not going to change anyone's life, but it's fun to show your kids that our dollar used to be backed by gold or silver. 
Uh, so, you know, kind of fun to pull out and, and talk to people about. So we're going to throw the first 50 people who either uh, call us or go to learedacted.com. Uh, we're going to throw in uh, one of those silver certificates for them as well. Oh, that's cool. I know you were texting earlier saying you've got you've got these free gifts for the audience. So that's nice. That's nice. Um, our audience is smart. I know many of them are gold investors. Many of them are silver investors. Um, and uh, so they can take advantage of that. They can give you guys a call. Um, at the 800 number there. You guys have been great uh, partners for us for many, many years. So just real quick, I'll, uh, I said I was going to get you out of here a second ago, but between gold and silver, like what do you think is the big play right now? We just see gold at all time highs. If I'm a big silver investor as well, do you think, you know, and it's cheap. I mean, relatively speaking, compared to gold, what do you, do you think, you know, silver's a smarter play here or gold is a smarter play? You know, if, if you're looking for profit, silver is like falling out of a basement window. I mean, you're just not going to get hurt, right? It's it's too low. So where the price of gold is, the last time gold was near its record highs, you know, the silver market was $47 an ounce and you're trading at around $24, $25 an ounce today. So uh, based on the fact that I believe there is going to be a recession and those recessions usually push uh, silver much higher, uh, I would invest in silver. And if a recession doesn't happen, Clayton, then you have 100 million ounces of silver literally leaving the market in the solar industry each year. So the price is going to continue to move up. So absolutely love the silver from a profit play. Yeah, from a profit play, also a commodities play right now. It's The demand is off the charts for everything that we need right now and these products that they're that the Biden administration is pumping billions of dollars into right now for solar panels and everything else. So, uh, Kevin, we always appreciate you joining us, uh, giving us some perspective on uh, the Fed's comments. As always, we'll keep our eyes on what this recession um, portends for the United States and as the U.S. dollar continues to be deflated with the money printing machine that they've got in Washington. Kevin, great to see you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Clayton. All right. Thanks so much, Kevin. And yeah, you can grab that free gold report, $3,200 an ounce. We've been talking about it for quite a while here. You can go to learredacted.com to grab that free gold report. I mean, when we started investing in precious metals, I mean, like a couple of years ago, and uh, we, you know, and we see all of these price targets, 3000 through $3,200. And when they want to get rid of U.S. currency and move towards a digital currency, I think you're going to see this continue to climb up right now. Yeah. So uh, exciting stuff for precious minerals holders out there right now. Um, we've got more news to get to here on your Thursday. We're going to talk about why Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates wants you to eat fake meat. And they're investing billions in it to make that happen. Also, is Justin Trudeau about to resign? Why is he telling people that he is under pressure and this is uh, he's incredibly bored and he thinks about quitting every day? This all comes right at an interesting moment on this massive carbon tax that's about to hit ca uh, Canadians, which could devastate their economy. Uh, we're going to look at that. Um, but first, our, you know, we're looking at interest rates right now. Three slashings of interest rates we could be seeing this year, according to the Fed, as we just talked about. Uh, that is uh, good news for a lot of people, right? Uh, but the Fed seems like they're in a real bind. If you heard what the Fed chief was saying, of course, he's on the one hand saying inflation is sticky. It's going to be here. Probably won't hit those 2% targets anymore. But at the same time, we're going to slash interest rates. He's walking a real fine line here right now. So while your cash is sort of sitting there, and actually we see a record number of Americans right now who are sitting on savings. They've actually saved a lot because they don't know what to do with their money. Well, while it's sitting there not doing anything and you're not investing it, why not put it in Moomoo's cash sweep account and earn 8.1% right now? Yeah, you're not investing it. You just open an account and you can move your extra money that you have in a crappy savings account where you get 0.001%. Move it over to Moomoo and you can get 8.1% right now as part of their cash sweep account. Just go to redacted.inc slash Moomoo. And their base rate is 5.1%. But right now, for a limited time, they're adding an additional 3% on top of that. So 8.1% while it's sitting there. And then, of course, when you do want to invest in something, your cash is right inside the trading app and you can make an investment. It's totally up to you. You can start investing in anything you want. Commodities, uh, precious minerals com uh, companies. It's totally up to you. And you get 15 free stocks when you sign up. Go to redacted.inc slash mumu, take advantage of the 15 free stocks plus the 8.1% APY right now for your parked money while you're waiting on what to do with it right now. So again, that's redacted.inc slash mumu. Well, Jeff Bezos wants to compete with Bill Gates to get you to eat fake meat. 
Why do these unelected globalists keep pushing this processed meat on you? Well, they want it. They think it's the future. The Bezos Earth Fund announced an initial $60 million commitment to establish Bezos Centers for Sustainable Protein. That's what they're calling it. Bezos fiance Lauren Sanchez is the vice chair of this association, and she announced this last week at the Aspen Ideas Climate Conference. Finally, one last question that we're thinking a lot about. How do we feed 10 billion people with healthy, sustainable protein throughout this century? This will need a ton of innovation. We're investing heavily in livestock sector and inventions that will give consumers meat options that are better for the earth. I am thrilled to announce, I'm very excited about this one tonight, $60 million to establish Bezos Centers for Sustainable Protein that will help grow these ideas. Their inventions will make plant-based lab-grown meats cheaper, healthier, and tastier. And these sustainable proteins really are getting better. Trust me, I've had one, and they are getting so good. You can hardly tell the difference now. I really like them. Uh, anyway, these examples barely scratch the surface of what's possible when we combine hope with action, ingenuity with determination. And all the processing goes right into my face and my lips and my cheeks. Oh, we're going to talk <laughs> about her in a second. My Where's God. the chart trust, like, trust me, she's, she's had one. I yeah, had one. I had one. I barely what a, what noticed. A, what an endorsement. I know. Trust me, I, mean, I had it's one. It's getting better. <laughs> it's getting better. I barely noticed that it was crap. Right. I think that history is going to look back on this as an incredibly arrogant moment where humans thought that they could do better than nature with labs. Um, so, yeah, let's let's just sort of unpack what she's saying there and what she's trying to push on us. She's saying that meat is terrible for the planet because climate activists say that meat is responsible for 14.5 percent of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. That is a global average, mean, meaning it takes into account well-run agricultural countries like the United States with non-developed countries that have a higher in, uh, carbon output because they are not as efficient. Uh, and in fact, yeah, you could reinvent meat or you could teach the rest of the world to farm better, like the United States and the United Kingdom. That's also a good idea. In fact, in the UK, beef production is only responsible for 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. And in the US, it's as low as 2.2%. So keep that number in mind, the fact that the United States is so good at agricultural farming, specifically livestock farming, that it's only 2% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. So that 14.5% number is misleading and climate alarmists know it. Here's a chart from the EPA showing in fact that beef emissions only add up to 2.2%. So why? Again, because in the US we get more efficient every single year. And according to the beef industry, they say doing more with less has decreased US beef emissions intensity by 29% and total carbon emissions by 30% since 1975. So consider how low that number is, 2%. Can lab-grown meat do any better? They cannot, and in fact, we already know it. In April of 2023, this study came out of UC Davis showing that lab-grown meat has a much higher carbon footprint than traditional livestock farmed meat. Researchers at UC Davis found what's called ACBM, or animal cell-based meat is much worse for the environment than traditional meat because instead of, oh, something that lives in nature, eats grass, contributes to carbon sink, instead you need this whole process. Now, I don't completely understand it, but I don't think that's better than a cow standing in a farm, do you? Uh, so all of this processing of things that come from Fields of monocrop culture, of, of monocrop fields, it's not at all better for the earth. And in fact, the researchers say that the results indicate that the environmental impact of this ACBM production is likely to be orders of magnitude higher than medium beef production and is highly refined growth medium utilized for ACBM production. And in fact, they said that lab grown meat could increase global warming between four and 25 times more than retail beef. So 
why do you think Jeff Bezos and Lawrence Sanchez think that this is the solution? Have they not seen this paper? Do they really think that their laboratories are going to do better than well-run agricultural farming? Wouldn't the obvious solution be to take the countries that are not efficient with agricultural livestock farming and teach them to do it more efficiently? Doesn't that seem, is that painfully obvious to anybody else here? Yes. Bueller, yes. Bueller, right? Okay, but the Bezos Earth Fund is saying, oh no, we're really concerned about methane. And in fact, they have launched a methane satellite into the sky a few weeks ago. And they're doing that because they want to share all this data with us. Watch. I don't know if you know this, but think about it. Methane has caused 30% of global warming. So how are we going to fix it? This is how. We're going to start right here with Methane Sat. It's a game-changing satellite we support with the Environmental Defense Fund. Now, before Methane Sat launched into orbit just last week, it just happened. It was so exciting to watch it go up in the air. Uh, we weren't able to see the big picture of where and how bad the methane leaks are. But because of the brilliant minds who figured out a better way, we now have innovative technology which we can see and measure leaks like never before. It's actually incredible. And we're really proud of this data because we're gonna make it free for everyone, which is good for those working hard to cut their admissions. Okay. Uh, so they I launch about three to four methane satellites a day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, launch a methane bomb. There's gonna be a red target over your house. Yeah. Right. Now they're going to start tracking us to, like the uh, the global poop map. Yeah. yeah. They're going to be watching your house. Why is that guy so hot? You know what the thing is, they're going to limit your Amazon purchases based on your methane output. That's what Bezos is going to do to you from now on. That they're scanning your house and like, nope, too much out of that house. Yeah. We're going to shut them down. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point this out because Lauren Sanchez is trending today on X because of this red carpet appearance. Some people are saying that, well, she looks a little masculine. Uh, maybe she's, you know, had plastic surgery to change her gender. No, she hasn't had any no, surgery. I don't, that's what's trending online. But I think, uh, I don't think she's a man. I think she's just a woman who have had, who's had a ton of plastic surgery and does not look like a 54 year old middle-aged woman would otherwise look. Uh, my point being, not to be mean, she should look like this if she wants to, right? She's rocking it. She's loving her pretty clothes and her rich fiance. But she may not be the role model for natural living that <laughs> we think? might want to follow her diet, right? She's got a lot of processed aftermarket stuff. So she may be more willing to eat processed meat than other people. She goes into some sort of chamber every night. Some sort well, of like... I just I see it. I see it as like, have you seen the movie Snowpiercer with Chris Evans? No. Where you've no. got like it's it's you know, it's basically it's basically just it's you know like a uh I can think of it like an, almost like an allegory on, on American society, but like in the back of this train, which is the all of human civilization now lives on this one train, and in the back they all eat these protein bars because they're in a closed environment. And so and they, they come to find out the protein bars are made by bugs or made from bugs. And then they break out of the back of the train as they move to the front of the train. They find the people in the front of the train, they have live chickens, they have a, a, an aquarium where they can get actual fresh sushi. And so it's like, you know, this is what this reminds me of is, you know, that the Bezos and these, these people that, that are billionaires are not going to be eating this, this lab grown meat. They're still going to get their cows, their chickens, their eggs. And it's just going to be everybody. They want everybody else to do it. It's and communism. That's just, that's, you know, it's, that's how it is. It's communism yeah. in action, right? It doesn't work because the, you know, because the proletariat will eat bugs, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, um, and the elites will eat the, eat meat, eat real foods, right? Yeah. And I don't know if she ever tried to be an actress at all, but that the lab grown meat is actually delicious. I didn't buy it. That no. was not good acting. So you can tell Philip is right. She means for you to eat it. She's not really going to eat it. Now, this is also a platform of Bill Gates. So these two uh, midlife crisis billionaires are on the same wavelength with the synthetic beef. Here's an interview that Bill Gates did recently with MIT Review uh, saying that he thinks synthetic beef is the way of the future. But he doesn't actually think the poorest 80 countries will be eating synthetic meat. He thinks all rich countries should eat synthetic beef. 
He says you can get used to the taste difference, and the claim is that they're going to make it taste even better. So rich countries should be eating synthetic beef, which is completely opposite because it's the rich countries that can produce beef with the lowest carbon output. What is he studying? I think he's just not. Um, and also, you know, they're selling this to you as we know you need protein, so we're going to push this synthetic protein on you. Only protein is not really the main macronutrient that we need from meat. And researchers are trying to warn us about this. In fact, Harvard-trained doctor and author Georgia Eddy warns this in her new book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. And she told the Daily Mail that it's less about proteins and more about the micronutrients that you cannot get from plants. She's talking about like, yes, you can get protein from vegetables, um, but you can't get some of the other, she says, essential nutrients that are much more difficult, if not in some cases impossible, to obtain from plants. She noted that meat is the only food that contains every nutrient we need in its proper form and also the safest food for our blood sugar and insulin levels. True, it does not spike your insulin. These nutrients include vitamin B12, omega-3 fatty acids, zinc, choline, iron, and iodine. You can get synthetic versions and maybe that's what they'll put in their lab grown meat. But in fact, there is also a lot of research showing that a meat free diet can be linked to depression and anxiety. Um, here are some of the things that I'm actually quite shocked that the Daily Mail linked to these stories. Uh, I'm not gonna read them all, but there's so many out there showing that in fact, um, a meat free diet is linked to depression and anxiety. Uh, pause this screen and seek out, seek out those stories for yourself or just uh, seek out this Daily Mail story. So Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Lauren Sanchez, eat that processed stuff if you want to. Do what you want to your body. Do what you want. Do what you want, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't care, but I do not want any part of this. Let us know how much you want in on their fake meat project. All right. Yeah, no fake meat for me. I will not touch it with a 10-foot kettle prod. Um, all right. What else have we got coming up on the show? We're going to talk about Justin Trudeau quitting. Um, he's been talking about it recently, and he's been talking about it in French, which he tends to do when he wants to get information out there and hopes that, I guess, people... I don't know how he does. He sort of puts it out there like a trial balloon. This is where he called the trucker convoy racist and misogynistic. Uh, he did that in French. He's also talking about resigning or thinks about resigning the office of the prime ministership in Canada. We're going to get to that um, in a second. But first, we have a newsletter that you should all subscribe to. It's totally free. It's the best newsletter in the world, if I do say so myself. It's a great way to start your morning. Get it, you know, about seven or eight in the morning over your cup of coffee and great way to start your day. You can read it in about five or 10 minutes. It's written by us, just the two of us, just Natalie and I, no one else. We keep the woke crap out of it and we just focus on the news that you can use. We cover a few stories plus things you missed overnight, some market news, information about gold, silver, what's going on with Bitcoin and the markets and stuff overnight while you were sleeping. Um, and again, it's a great way to start your day. Go to redacted.inc. That's the place to go. That's the website, not .com. It's .inc. Put in your email address. You will receive a welcome email from us. You have to confirm that you want the newsletter though. So look for your spam folder, your junk folder, and then click on confirm. And then on Monday morning, when we publish the newsletter again, Monday morning, Monday through Thursday, uh, then you'll receive it in your inbox on Monday. So go to redacted.inc. Well, Canadians are getting very excited about the prospect that Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, is about to resign. Yes, is Justin Trudeau going to resign? Well, he just did an interview where he was speaking in French and wanted to let uh, Canadians know that he finds the job incredibly boring and that he often thinks about resigning on a regular basis. So is, is, it, is Prime Minister Trudeau about to resign? Are we getting our hopes up? Canadians are not the only ones suffering. Justin Trudeau has it very tough. Do you hear about this? He, he, he's a little bit bored. Did you hear about this? Incredible, this quote. I got to read these quotes here for day. He said this in French in an interview with Rad Ken. He said, I think about quitting every day. Oh, isn't that funny? We think about firing him every day. <laughs> oh my God. Let's bring in from Ottawa, Canada, David Creighton, independent journalist who's been watching this. And David, I have to ask you, it's very interesting to me. I know over the past couple of years, 
Trudeau has managed to do a couple of interviews where he does them in French. And I remember we've had to translate some of them, but they end up being some of his most controversial interviews. But he does them in French. I guess he thinks that no one will pay attention or no one can use a translating app or no one can translate what he's saying here. So what what actually happened here? Yeah, you're quite right. He does do these interviews in French where he says things that are potentially very embarrassing for him. And he's done this in the past, but what happened last week? He did an interview with uh, Radio Canada, which is the French CBC. And it was all in French, there was no English. And he made a number of very uh, surprising and arguably very stupid statements. You know, he, he said that he, is, he thinks about quitting, and he said quitting every day as prime minister he said that he finds the job and the word he used in french was super plat which means it translates to super boring he finds the job of prime minister being super boring Uh, he said uh, the only reason he stays on and he talked about all the hardships he's had to endure which a lot of people just rolled their eyes at saying he's talking about hardships right he's the victim he's the victim here he paints himself as the victim in this interview and says he's he's got to stick to it because he's got to see these policies through. And of course, the policies he's really talking about, the ones he really cares about the most, they're the LGBTQ, gender ideology, giving billions to Ukraine and keeping a euthanasia program going. Those seem to be the, the policies he's really committed to, along with economic catastrophe. But he has in the past, as you pointed out at the beginning, said things in these French interviews that he really pretends he didn't say. For instance, he called the unvaccinated and the participants in the Freedom Convoy racist and misogynistic. That was the first reference to this was in a French interview. And of course, he lied about saying that repeatedly, including on the witness stand at the Emergencies Act inquiry. He was grilled by the Freedom Convoy lawyer, Eva Chepiuk, And he lied about having said this. And of course, when I covered the story, I just merely replayed the video of him saying that. (laughs) It's exactly what he did. He called them names. And this is what he often does in French. So the the interview is really galvanizing, if it needed to be galvanized anymore. Opinion against Trudeau, because here's a guy who's 20 points down in the polls against Pierre Polyev. His Liberal Party is 20 points behind the Conservative Party. And he's talking about quitting? I think a lot of Liberals are going to be saying, hey, you want to quit, brother? It's time you quit because you're doing the party no good. And uh, I think most Canadians think he's doing Canada no good. But he's in a vulnerable position. And and to admit that he thinks about quitting every day, well, I, I think that's an open door to, to say bye-bye. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, this is why I find this interesting because well, he's saying that you don't, I mean, these guys don't say anything out of turn, right? This is all calculated and it's on purpose. So why is he saying this? Why is he late? Is this sort of a trial balloon here to see if liberals have anyone else they want to put forth and get him out of there? Um, we know, obviously, he's separated from his wife. I mean, who knows what's going on there? So uh, he's playing the victim here that it's been, you know, detrimental to his family. And he he wants to step aside. Is this a trial balloon? I always think about these things in terms of American politics as well. When you hear these stories being pushed out there, there's something else is going on here. So do you think liberals are lining up another candidate? There doesn't seem to be a clear alternative uh, to Justin Trudeau, even amongst liberals. Christia Freeland is obviously mentioned. She's the deputy prime minister. But she's loathed in circles because of her condescending uh, attitude towards an ordinary Canadian. I mean, she's so supercilious. So I don't think there's a clear candidate to replace him. And what's strange is that as we speak today, there's going to be a non-confidence vote in the House of Commons. It doesn't happen every week or every month. This is a significant event brought up by Pierre Polyev on the basis that the carbon tax, you know, this this incredible tax that Canadians pay on their heating bills on their gasoline at the pump, on all fossil fuel energy, and even including hydroelectricity, that this is 
forming the basis of a non-confidence motion in the House of Commons today. It was supposed to be last night. Things got pushed to tomorrow. It got too late. But Trudeau is maniacal right now in the House during question period about his insistence that only he understands what's best for Canada. Only Justin Trudeau knows what Canadians need. So he is grasping at power right now. He's not looking like a man who wants to leave uh, of his own volition by any means. And his, his attitude in the House right now is hysterical. And he, he, he literally knocked the glass of water off of his desk yesterday onto his another cabinet minister's uh, working space. And there's water everywhere. He seems to be so pumped up on whatever it is he's using right now. And I, I don't know what else to say except that he does not look like a man who wants to leave. He, he really believes that the carbon tax is, is saving Canada from the, the perils of the of climate change. Well, how is this going to affect how is this going to affect average Canadians this carbon tax? I mean, how what will they end up paying here? Well, in British Columbia, they're already paying over $2 a liter, not gallon, liter for gasoline. Wow. So it means in Ontario here, we'll be paying about a dollar 80. That's what it really comes down to. I mean, that's a heck of a lot of money to pay for gas every time. And of course, it goes on your heating bill. Now, Trudeau is also lying when he says Canadians get back more than they than they pay, or at least equal amounts than they pay in this so-called carbon rebate. But the, own, the parliamentary budget officer revealed this week that that's a sham. That's not the case. It's Canadians are paying twice as much as they ever get back in this little stipend of a Trudeau rebate. And he's lying about that too. So it's it, it's incredible economic hardship on on Canadians, but even worse, it's an economic hardship on business and especially farms. Farms are paying like literally eighty thousand dollars a month in taxes, wow. just to heat their farm area, the, the the barns, mushroom farms for for instance, eighty thousand dollars a month. A local mushroom farmer in Ottawa is, is paying on. So it is incredibly destructive, this tax. And Trudeau seems to be wanting to, to fall on his sword over it. Now, whether or not he's going to get the NDP support in this non-confidence motion or not, I don't know. That There seems to be some wavering there. Most of the provinces in Canada now are united against the carbon tax because it is creating economic disorder and tremendous hardship for ordinary people who just want to drive their cars and heat their homes or in the summer, of course, uh, air condition their homes if they have that luxury. Yeah, I just don't understand how you can say this job is boring. Seems to me if you're prime minister of Canada with all of the problems you currently have, maybe it's boring because he's created a lot of these problems. And so now he can sit back and he doesn't have much else to do other than watch Canada spiral into the ground right now. Well, one can only hope that he resigns. Uh, and we'll see what happens down 20 points. We'll keep our eyes on this, and we'll keep our eyes on this carbon tax. Obviously, the Biden administration doubling down as well on the green agenda. So maybe these puppets in the World Economic Forum and the globalists are trying to keep these guys in charge until they can push and ram through this this agenda. David, great to see you. What? Yeah, go ahead, David. I, I was just I was just going to say, Clayton, it's interesting that BBC broke this story because. Right. Everywhere Trudeau goes in the world, he makes enemies. And, and the country that hates him the most right now is India. <laughs> Every time right. he goes to India, he makes an ass of himself. What did he do when he was last? Well, in Britain, uh, very infamously, the night before the state funeral for Queen Elizabeth II, he delivers this bizarre piano bar rendition of Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, looking very, very drunk shall we say this was captured by a videographer on the scene the video went around the world and once again it made justin trudeau look like a child who doesn't take serious events very seriously and i wouldn't doubt for a minute that trudeau's enemies in the british press and there are several and there are they are a lot wanted to get him on this interview and i mm -hmm. think that that's exactly what they've done so you make enemies around the world the way Justin Trudeau has, and the chickens come home to roost. Hmm. Friends, 
Who needs friends? What, what is the saying? Who needs who needs friends when you've got en- with enemies like this, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. David, great to see you. We appreciate it as always. Thank you so much, Clayton. All right, everyone. Well, that's going to do it for Redacted on this Thursday. We hope that you, uh, you had a wonderful week here. A much better week than Apple is doing, being sued by the Department of Justice for uh, a monopoly over their iPhone. Mm. Um, so I don't think that's going to go well for them. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of news that we're going to be covering through the weekend and on into the early part of next week. So thank you guys so much for being a part of our show. We really, really appreciate it. Um, head over to redacted.inc to become part of our community. And we'll be back here on Monday with another live show. Again, have a great weekend, everyone.